Greetings, ladies and gentlemen. Good morning, good afternoon, or good evening, depending on where you are in the world. On behalf of Feed the Future, USAID's Bureau for Resilience and Food Security, and the Bureau for Humanitarian Assistance, I welcome you to our webinar, Enhancing Root, Tuber, and Banana Crops' Contributions to Food Security food and nutrition security. I am your host and friendly neighborhood strategy and learning advisor, Zachary Bakke, with the Bureau for Resilience and Food Security. I will moderate today's webinar. Before we dive into the content, let us take a moment to go over a few items to orient you to the BlueJeans webinar platform. On the right side of your screen, you will see where most of your controls are located. Uh, You'll see a list of participants, the chat event, uh, which is the little bubble, and then you'll see uh, the Q&A um, bubble. Uh, so do use the chat box to introduce yourself, share resources, and to connect and network with your colleagues from around the globe. Use the Q&A button to post your questions. Please indicate for whom your question is. If you see a question you want to hear answer, answered or one that is the same as yours, you can upvote it with the thumbs up icon. You can ask questions in the Q&A uh, box throughout the webinar. We will have our Q&A session after the presenters have spoken. In case you find the presentation too small, you can increase the size of it um, by using the slide bar underneath the image. Take a moment to adjust the view to suit you. Lastly, we are recording this webinar and will email you the recording, transcript, and additional resources once we have them ready. We will also post these resources on agrilinks.org. Thank you for your attention. Now onwards to our presentations and discussions for today's webinar, Enhancing Root, Tuber, and Banana Crops' Contribution to Food and Nutrition Security. I'm pleased to introduce our speakers for this webinar. First off, Stephen Walsh is an agricultural advisor with USAID's Bureau for Humanitarian Assistance. He has been privileged to work collaboratively with research and development colleagues at national and local levels to develop and implement research and advise on impact-oriented seed systems for both true seed and vegetative propagated crops for smallholder farmers in more than a dozen countries in sub-Saharan Africa. His seed system interest areas include how to build more responsive demand-driven seed systems, promoting private sector engagement with an emphasis on small and informal sector actors, and strengthening the analytical analytic tools and capacity of practitioners to better understand and design seed systems interventions. Our next speaker, Graham Thiel, is director of the CGIR Research Program on Roots, Tubers, and Bananas, RTB, led by the International Potato Center. He has led the RTB program for the last 10 years, making an example of collaborative research for development in the CGIR. Graham is a social scientist and expert in targeting, priority setting, and impact and adoption studies of new agricultural technologies. Previously, he was the leader for social and health sciences at KIPP. He developed, he helped to develop implement and assess several novel participatory methodologies designed to link farmers with markets, inform research agendas, and promote innovation in policy, policies, products, and technology uptake. Next, James Legg is a scientist at the International Institute of Tropical Agriculture with more than 20 years experience of working on plant viruses and their insect vectors. James has focused on strengthening understanding of cassava viruses and using that improved understanding to develop and facilitate the promotion of control strategies. James has also contributed to strengthening science capacity in African countries through producing training materials, leading training workshops, and supervising postgraduate students. James has been involved in several regional research for development projects focused on cassava viruses, their white fly vectors, and the development and implementation of sustainable seed systems. Next, Margaret McEwen is a senior scientist at the International Potato Center's Regional Office for, Agriculture for Africa based in Kenya. A social scientist, Margaret has over 30 years experience working in multidisciplinary teams focused on rural development, farming systems research, household security and nutrition, in research for, <coughs> pardon me, 
in, re <clears throat> in research for development context, <coughs> pardon, is concerned with how to engage Hard not enough liquid this morning. Um, <clears throat> concerned with how to engage multi-stakeholder partnerships in ensuring improved livelihood and nutrition outcomes, and in understanding the conditions required to upscale technologies for greater impact. Lastly, uh, Frederick Gobina Grant is a public health nutrition epidemiologist at the International Potato Center with over 15 years experience in implementation of nutrition sensitive programs in Sub-Saharan Africa and South Asia. He is currently the KIPP Uganda Country Manager and Nutrition Scientist. He leads the CGR research program on roots, tubers, and bananas cluster on nutrition, sweet potato for expanding markets and improving diets. Previously, he's, he worked as nutrition specialist and project manager for viable sweet potato technologies for Africa and as project leader for Mama Sasha uh, project at KIPP. With that, I will hand it over to Stephen Walsh, who will provide opening remarks. Stephen? Good morning, good afternoon, everyone. It's great to see such interest in root tuber and banana, and we really look forward to the presentations planned for today. As Zachary noted, I work for the Bureau for Humanitarian Assistance which brings together the resources and expertise of what were USAID's Office of Food for Peace and the Office of U.S. Foreign Disaster Assistance. Now we are one USAID Bureau, U.S. Government Lead for Global Humanitarian Assistance. The BHA funding portfolio in 2020 included more than 100 emergency applications, and of these, approximately uh, one quarter included RTB crops. We recognize the importance of the root tuber and banana crops from both the food systems resilience and a climate smart agriculture perspective. In humanitarian context, we believe there is significant scope for expanding the scale, efficacy, and impact of our partners' work with vegetatively propagated crops. And in this respect, we hope that today's talks will not only remind us how important these crops are in terms of their contribution to kilocalories, income, nutrition, and livelihoods, particularly for vulnerable populations, but also help us to recognize the expansion, the, to, to understand that there's been a tremendous expansion in RTB crops over the last several decades. In today's talks, we think we'll provide a window into some of the really innovative work that's occurring to raise not only productivity, but also equity and impact of the work that's occurring or possible to occur with root tuber and banana crops. So without further ado, I would just like to lastly wish that today's webinar in the entire AgriLinks RTB month plays an important role in terms of contributing to expanding the scale, efficacy, and impact of our partners' work with vegetatively propagated crops. Thank you. Uh, good afternoon, good, good morning, everyone. Can you see my screen? Is that sharing? It is not sharing at the moment, Graham. Okay, let's see if that's going to share. Is that sharing? It's still blank. Up oh, there it I think is. It's coming. It's it's working yep. its way through. Okay, fantastic. It's working. I'm connected. Right. So I'm going to talk about the RTB crops, uh, roots, tubers, and bananas, and and a little bit about the RTB program, which is working on these very important crops. I'd also like to. Well, it's great to see so many friends and colleagues on the call. We're very appreciative of AgriLinks for creating this space for this important set of crops. So we hope, in addition to the webinars, you're also following the very excellent blogs that have been posted. Uh, so with no more ado, a little bit of explanation about our program within the CGIR. So we work on multiple root tubers and banana crops. Uh, these are the main ones we're working on. And 
what we're seeking to do is to work globally to really harness the untapped potential of this crop set. They've been historically somewhat neglected compared to, say, the, the research and development done on cereals. And there's huge opportunities to improve food security, nutrition, income, uh, improve climate change resilience, and, and, and generally improve the, the, the well-being of smallholders and consumers of the crops. So that's sort of the background to this. And then people often ask me, well, you know, why roots, tubers, and bananas? You can kind of see, you know, if you have an IQ test, you can see when you tick the boxes, roots and tubers kind of go together, but bananas? So why are the bananas in there? And actually, it does make sense. Uh, all these crops share, actually, they're very genetically complicated. Big challenges for doing breeding compared with, with grains, which are, which are more straightforward. And that's because they're, they're what's called vegetatively propagated crops. So we don't have tiny seeds like maize or rice that can be stored and dry and easily transported. These are living materials which are generally quite bulky and they carry pests and diseases and they create lots of challenges for seed systems, which we're coming on to as one of our real key topics later in the talk. Um, they're also actually on people's plates, have a similar role as staples, particularly in, in, in many parts of sub-Saharan Africa, um, other Australasia as well, and actually in the Amazon. So, and because of that role as staples, there's a lot of role there for improving health through biofortification. So major roles there into diets, but they are quite perishable, bulky, and that creates both challenges and opportunities for adding value to make them more storable, more usable, more easy to transport. So very interesting and dynamic crop set. And we've, as an RTB program, we've actually now been working on these different topics for about 10 years. Um, but I wanted to just come back and look and see what the big picture is on, on root tubers and bananas and, and what you see around the world. This is like, the trends for the past 50 years across the major crops. In general, they're all trending up. We can say that RTB crops are surging in developing countries. Uh, a bit of a mixed story there on sweet potato at the top there, which is kind of flat. Um, and then if I come onto the next slide, that sort of explains a little bit the reason of what's going on there. So what we see in general is that these crops are increasingly important in Africa. Now, the colored bars there are for 10 year periods. So if we look at the banana bar, uh, the first one on the left, so the blue is for the period of 1961 to 60. That's the percentage of the area in the world under RTB crops, which are grown in Africa. So it went from 28% at the beginning of the period to over getting close to 40% at the end. And so if you look across the crop set, um, three of those crops over the whole period uh, actually have had more than half of the area in Africa. And in the case of cassava and, and in, in particular, and yam, it's actually gone up, plantain more or less flat. And over the past 15 or 20 years, sweet potato has dramatically increased in importance in Africa. So it went from being a minority crop based on its world share in, in Africa to being the predominant place where, where sweet potato is now grown. So some important trends there. And actually, where it's grown as a staple, uh, and this is particularly in Africa, other places as well, this is from Africa, the contribution of RTB foods to food intake in these countries is extremely important. So in DR Congo, on the, the information is a bit fragmentary, but the information we have, it's a, coming up for 60% of all that's total kilocalories are coming from, um, from rich tubers and bananas in, in the Congo. In other countries, it's similarly up, getting up to 50% in several cases. And 20 to 30, these are very, very high levels of, 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 of intake. So that, you know, it's important to sustain that in terms of food security, but also opening these big windows of opportunity for, for improving diets through by, uh, um, by fortification. Um, outside of, of these areas where it's a real major staple, Asia and, 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 the, and the Latin American Caribbean, also has a really major role in terms of diversity and resilience in cropping systems. So it may be less important as a staple, but it certainly can be extremely important. This is just one illustration of the, of the resilience of RTV crops. That's the hurricane Mpong. You can see it kind of going through northern Philippines there. And, and, and the photo there is a field in, 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 in the Philippines uh, where that typhoon came through. And most other crops were, were severely damaged, but sweet potatoes, because it's uh, quite ground hugging, was actually barely damaged. So it, that's just one example of the role of roots and tubers in, in resilience in, in terms of climate change and extreme climate events. Um, so the RTB program, actually, um, we've been, as I said, working for 10 years, and we've developed through 
the collaboration, building on, on these unique features of our crops, which I mentioned in, in the first slide, we have a series of communities of practice um, which have come together to develop um, models, tools, which are more broadly available. We call these the RTB golden eggs, which make unique contributions to improving um, uh, quality of life in the global food system. These are all available on our website. You can see them tracked there. And the CGIR is presently undergoing a, a major and important reform towards what's called the one CGIR. So we see these uh, golden eggs as part of the vehicle for taking the amazing work that we've done during the 10 years of RTP uh, into the sort of the future environment of the one CGIR. And also these, these golden eggs are, are very important for many other partners and users. So that's one of the ways in which we're capturing the, the work we've achieved through our different teams and we'll be having some of the golden egg work presented coming up right away so you'll learn more about that in particular the seed system toolbox and, and our work on pests and diseases which is just coming up um, so really the take-home messages then from my introductory talk is that root tubers of banana crops are of extreme importance they're becoming increasingly important particularly so in Africa uh, they're especially important to many of the vulnerable and most disadvantaged groups around the world in, in, in the places where they're grown. Sometimes they're actually called women's crops, a bit of a simplification, but that does reflect very often their importance in, in home gardens and for women in particular. Um, they also, well, if you've been following the COVID-19 impacts and, and many global supply chains, uh, which are kind of, kind of quite long and complex, are, are quite impacted by the COVID-19 impacts, whereas the RTB crops, typically they're produced locally. They have what are called short value chains. So they've been more resilient in the face of the potential disruptions through, through COVID-19. And as I said, because of the potential nutritional benefits, they can be really very much improving nutritional status of populations under conditions in which there may be quite some disruption of, of uh, global trade. There's a big opportunity we see there. We have these RTB golden eggs, the, the, the assets, the collective assets we've worked on together, which we'd like to work on and promote. And this webinar actually is part of that. And uh, I mentioned that these crops really, compared to the huge potential they have, are underinvested. Uh, so we urgently need more, more R&D funding for RTB crops coming both from, I think, from major donors and from national governments. So um, th those are my take home messages. Um, I'm going to stop there and hand over to the next presenter. And I hope this kind of sets the scene on what the importance of roots, tubers, and bananas and the importance actually of our research program, which is actually, you can see there, uh, the, um, it's a, a, a very much a collaborative endeavor amongst these different, um, amongst the different CG programs with many partners led by the International Potato Center. So thank you. And I hand over to my next presenter. Stop sharing. Uh, good, good morning and good afternoon, everybody, uh, and thank you, Graeme, for that introduction. I'm, I'm really happy to be here today uh, representing one of the communities of practice um, of the RTB, the RTB Seed Systems Community of Practice, and sharing one of our innovations, one of our golden eggs, which is the RTB Tools for Seed Systems, or what we call the Toolbox. So Graham has really highlighted the importance of the RTB crops for millions of people around the world, particularly in vulnerable situations. But what we really need to make sure that these populations benefit from RTB crops are functioning seed systems. Because whatever touches on the seed system will also touch on food security. So seed systems are needed to make sure that farmers can access the varieties that they like, particularly improved varieties with market preferred traits. And that these need to reach all farmers, not just some, but all farmers. And we also need to remember that seed carries more than the genes. So seed can also carry disease. And this is one of the concerns for the RTB crops. But we also realize that as seed flows through a system, 
there's information flowing with that seed. And that information can be agronomic information in terms of crop production or information about how to use the crop uh, once it's been harvested. And with these information flows, there are also normally very strong social networks. And these networks have culture and practices around seed embedded in them. So understanding these social networks and seed systems is critically important. But seed systems also bring us new beginnings and, and hope. And this is critically important for vulnerable populations who are perhaps recovering from disasters or post-conflict situations. So when we're looking at any seed system for whatever type of crop, we need to understand what farmers are wanting, what, what their demand is. And yes, they're looking for varieties with preferred traits. Those traits may be agronomic in relation to yield or the maturity of the crop, but they're also particularly for the RTB crops looking for quality traits, perhaps related to cooking or the texture of, of, the, of the flesh. So the farmers are also wanting availability of sufficient quantities of seed at the right time and also to be able to access that seed from somewhere that is located uh, close to them or is easily accessible, but also accessible in terms of the seed is um, at an affordable cost. And then we need healthy seed to ensure better yields but for increased food security and, and income. Now, Graham has mentioned that the root tuber and banana crops, that their seed systems are, are unique. When we talk about seed, we're talking in a general sense, not necessarily about true seed, but uh, seed can be planting material, suckers, vines, tubers. And because of the vegetably propagated nature of the crop, the seed systems are very different and have unique characteristics and challenges compared to the seed systems of cereal crops, such as maize, wheat and rice. There are low multiplication rates generally, and this means that we need to think of uh, improved seed production methods and look at the cost of multiplication and the speed of multiplication. As Graham said, the, the seed can be bulky and that has implications for, for transport cost and it's also perishable in many cases. So we need to think whether the seed production sites can be centralized or perhaps they need to be decentralized to make the seed available closer to farmers. There's also a risk of seed-borne diseases and pests and that can impact on the potential yields in the main crop. And because these crops are vegetatively propagated, they're also easy for farmers to multiply. So the business case for seed commercialization for the private sector varies by crop and context. We know that potato, the, the seed potato market has a very strong private sector engagement but other crops such as sweet potato, there's less engagement, but this varies by crop and context. So the follow on from that is that the importance of the informal seed system vis-a-vis -vis the formal seed system will really vary depending on the crop and context. So in order to address these challenges, over more than five years, our community of practice has developed the toolbox. And this is one of the golden eggs. And there are 11 tools and one glossary. And these tools can be used to understand the socioeconomic dimensions of seed systems, the biophysical dimensions of seed systems, but also how those two dimensions interact. And that, that is what is really exciting about the work that we've been doing 
for the toolbox. So each tool has a description sheet and a user guide. And we've looked carefully at each tool in terms of how we can make sure that we're understanding gender constraints and gender implications for these different topics. And then the tools have been validated in at least two crop and country contexts and written up as peer-reviewed publications. And there's also um, technical support available. So the tools and the toolbox, they're replicable, they're open source, and they're backed by science. And currently, the tools are being used by development practitioners, either from the government or NGOs, and also researchers. And the information which is coming out from the application of the tools is being used by program managers and decision makers to improve the design of seed systems, to improve the design of the interventions, and to strengthen the seed system. So I've talked a bit about varieties being attractive to farmers, what makes varieties attractive to farmers. And there's been a lot of work by the breeders to identify what traits are attractive to farmers. But we also need to think about what, what makes a seed source attractive to farmers and why they might use one seed source rather than another. And work done by colleagues in Uganda on banana seed systems has really looked from a farmer perspective, what are their considerations when they are choosing a seed source? So they're interested in sources which have a high diversity of cultivars, which have quant the quantities of seed available that they want and the timing that they want. But they're also interested in using sources that are knowledgeable, trustworthy, that the transaction conditions are appropriate to the farmer's situation, and also they're thinking about the cost of, of transport, because as we've said, the seed can be bulky. So when we're designing seed delivery pathways, we need to really think from the farmer's perspective. And that means that the seed delivery pathways may need to be tweaked. Then we may need different delivery pathways depending on the gender of the farmer, the scale of production, and what are the production objectives of the farmer. So again, as part of seed sourcing, we're also interested in who are the super spreaders. If a new variety gets into a community, who, how, who does that go to and, and how do people get that variety? So again, we've got different tools in the toolbox that can support that, um, that information. Uh, we've used a tool called seed tracing, which is particularly important for the informal seed systems and looking at farmer to farmer seed exchange. And in Ethiopia, where this tool has been used, it showed that if we want to reach resource poor households, it may be better to have a strategy where the seed is distributed to better off households because this study showed that it was the better off model farmers in the Ethiopian context that distributed more seed of new varieties than resource poor households. And then for the formal system, IITA have worked to develop Seed Tracker, which is an e-platform which regulatory bodies in Nigeria and Tanzania are using to track the quantities and quality of seed distributed through the formal system. We also have the tool called Impact Network Analysis, and this take, can take more of a metadata level perspective and be used to build scenarios for system management. Using impact network analysis, we're able to characterize different distribution nodes for targeting the dissemination of not only varieties, 
but see how diseases might spread. And so we can identify which nodes may be more appropriate for disease surveillance. And we're currently looking at using impact network analysis to integrate data from seed tracing in the informal seed systems with seed tracker from the formal systems to see what are the linkages between the formal and informal systems and how can we leverage them. So often we're asked, you've got the toolbox, so where do we start? Well, we suggest that there are two entry points. One can be using the project cycle. So you can start at problem identification, move through to strategy, implementation, and monitoring and evaluation. And there are different tools which can be used to understand the existing seed systems, what are the bottlenecks, and what are the potential interventions to address those bottlenecks. Another perspective is to use the seed value chain and where an intervention might be in the seed value chain, whether it's more upstream at early generation seed or further downstream in terms of farmer and trader use. And once again, different tools can be used at different stages to understand the bottlenecks and how best to intervene. So wrapping up, we launched the Tools for Seed Systems Toolbox in March this year, and the objective is really to work with different organizations and collaborators to design and implement more effective seed intervention. So we are inviting you to join us for a, a program for training and mentoring in the use of the tools, which will run from July to November 2021. And this will be appropriate for both development and humanitarian context. And so we're really happy to be here and to be part of this AgriLinks community. It's great to see old friends and colleagues and new faces as well. And together, we want to be building a better seed future. So thank you. I'll stop sharing and hand over to James. Good day, everybody. So um, this is James Legg, and I'm coming to you from the coast of East Africa in Dar es Salaam in Tanzania. And um, I'm going to be talking to you a little bit about some of the work that's already been uh, presented by Graham and Margaret. So a little bit about the golden eggs, a little bit about some of the seed system tools. But my focus is on monitoring cassava diseases using a phone app called Plant Village Nuru. Um, also known as the power of knowledge. And this is work that's been um, developed by colleagues at Plant Village, um, which is, is run out of Penn State University in the US. Um, and for the cassava work, it's been done together with our group here in, in Tanzania with ITA, with the support of RTB. Now, this is what we would like to see. This is how cassava should appear. Um, if it's growing healthy and um, and producing nice tuberous roots. And indeed, cassava is a hugely important crop, as Graham has, has highlighted. Um, this is, these are production data for some of the major food staples in sub-Saharan Africa. Um, and you can see here, these are just data for 2019. Um, but you can see in terms of total production, Cassava is actually double everything else. Um, it's, you know, most people would, would think that maize is the biggest crop. It um, is similar in total area to cassava, but in terms of production, cassava is number one, and it's going to be increasingly important um, in, in times of climate change because it's very resilient to uh, challenging climates. Unfortunately, a lot of the cassava that we encounter um, in the countries of sub-Saharan Africa looks like this. Um, they're affected by diseases. This is a virus disease, cassava mosaic virus disease. You can see this farmer here um, just south of Lake Victoria in Tanzania. Um, his crop started out healthy, in fact, but it was heavily hit by this virus disease. 
Another major virus disease, uh, these are the two main constraints of cassava Africa-wide. The second one is cassava brown street disease. It causes this dry brown necrotic rot. And together, these have huge impacts on production. So how can we uh, begin to address um, you know, these challenging issues? Well, so, some fundamentals. Firstly, um, as I've mentioned, diseases and pests have a devastating impact, particularly in Africa. As we know, to manage diseases, we need to monitor them. COVID-19 has been a wonderful example of that. To monitor them, we need diagnostic tests. And the most important diagnostic technology in 2021 for our case of diagnosing cassava is the eye. So we use visual inspections. That remains the most important um, diagnostic approach to recognizing uh, these major disease, diseases and pests of cassava. As we all know, however, there are a dizzying array of different um, complex molecular um, diagnostic approaches that can be applied um, for cassava viruses, for other pathogens. Um, and these become ever more sophisticated, ever more precise. Some will measure single virus particles. But as you will know, most of these are um, sophisticated and they require to be done in laboratories. So, we need to find solutions that can be applied at field level. So we're looking for new tech for a new disease detection paradigm. And this might build on um, helping um, visual assessment using a camera. It might um, help us if we can use tel telephony, um, telephone technology, if we can uh, use the networks that, that we have. And of course, all of this is bundled into the wonderful te tech that we have these days called the smartphone. Now, when talking about smartphones in Africa, everyone says, oh, you know, farmers don't have smartphones. Now, probably this is largely true at the moment. But um, the point is that this uh, scenario is changing dramatically, really, really fast. Um, anyone who's lived here for the last five years will have you know, seen the, the changes that are happening. So the final image there from the GSM um, Association, you can see smartphone as a percentage of connections, 2018, 39%, rising to 66% by 2025, so an almost doubling. So we're strong believers in the fact that um, reasonably priced smartphones are going to find their way into farmers' hands very soon if they're not there already. These are the major diseases and pests that drag down the production of cassava in Africa. So we're talking cassava mosaic virus disease, cassava brown streak virus disease, cassava green mite, and healthy. And immediately you can see from your eyes that they look different. They cause more than a billion dollars worth of damage annually, so we'd rather not lose that. Um, but what's been possible is to use um, artificial intelligence, machine learning, and with the um, computer team at Plant Village, um, they've used TensorFlow software to develop an app that is able to um, recognize the objects, the, the images associated with um, the symptoms of the main disease and pest damage types of cassava. Um, so we have different features. These have been put into an app, which is now available on Google's Play Store. And there's, there's an, a, a portion that's dedicated to fall armyworm. We've got the cassava one here, which is, I'm going to talk about. Um, you can point, uh, fire it up and point the camera um, at a, an image of a cassava leaf, and it'll tell you what it sees. Um, it'll give you, it's got a library of pictures of all the different diseases, so you can make like with like comparisons. Um, there are videos to guide you, um, cartoons to show how it's done. And there's advice for each of the main uh, diseases and pests, um, telling you how to best control them. So these are some of the key features. Um, it's powered by TensorFlow object recognition, um, hosted by Plant Village. Um, these are the four conditions that I've mentioned that are recognized. Um, it can be used offline. So you don't need an internet connection if you have a smartphone and you've downloaded. Um, you don't need an internet connection to be able to make diagnoses in the field. Um, it's available already in several languages, and it's got also a language translation facility, which can be applied so that you can convert it to a, another language. 
Um, it's currently in Africa being relatively widely scaled. Um, and as mentioned, it is available through Google's Play Store. So if you go there and you type Plant Village Nuru, you will find it. It was, it was made available in June 2018, um, and it's been rolling out ever since. Um, this is how, if you fire it up and you point it at a leaf of cassava that's got brown streak symptoms, this is what it'll show you. It'll pick out symptoms in boxes. Um, same thing with cassava green mite damage, and same thing with cassava mosaic disease damage. So a big question is, well, okay, so that looks nice, but you know, how accurate is it, and how good is it in uh, recognizing these diseases compared to, let's say, an expert trained researcher, or let's say an extension officer, or let's say a farmer. So we've done some experiments comparing teams of researchers, both trained, these are the cassava ones, untrained, maybe the maize ones, um, extensionists trained on cassava, not, farmers familiar with cassava, growing cassava, or not, and we've tested them all to see how they do in recognizing a, a fixed set of images showing symptoms of different types. And what you'll see from the lines here is that Nuru, even if it's it's looking at one leaf only, um, it's able to perform, you know, as well as a trained extension officer. Once you give it six leaves, so you show it show it a plant that's got six leaves with symptoms, um, then it's it's already giving you a better performance than even the the most trained extension officer, and almost comparable with the um, the lower end of trained researchers. So. You know, we think this tool is, is extremely beneficial, particularly if you think that if it's in the hands of extensionists or farmers um, who know potentially nothing about these diseases, you know, it's going to give them a big um, support in um, making the first identifications of these diseases. At the back end, there is a, um, a mapping facility that illustrates where all the reports are made. So thousands of downloads have been made. There's in Africa more than 30,000 reports have been accumulated so far um, from more than 20 countries. And currently, it's being scaled through West Africa through a West Africa virus epidemiology project, and in East Africa through a CGIAR Inspire project. Um, we can drill down, we can look at individual countries. So this is Tanzania now. So the, the big pink spot on the right, which says Salam, that's where I am, Dar es Salaam. We go south of there, about 70 kilometers south of Dar es Salaam. We come to a place called Mkuranga. There's a location with with a, a red spot here. So we're going to go here. And if we zoom into that area, it's called Mkuranga. So we can pick out individual plants in individual fields, and it'll show us the diagnoses. And these can also be mapped um, in uh, other kinds of maps which show the proportions of the different diseases detected in different areas. So this provides users with the potential to identify the problems that are affecting their cassava. Now, how do they access the solution? So this is where we're linking up with um, one of the tools that Margaret mentioned called Seed Tracker. And Seed Tracker is another ICT platform. It operates on laptop, um, tablet, or phone. Um, and it's all about um, controlling the process, managing the process of quality seed delivery, um, facilitating the work of cassava seed commercial enterprises. So in Tanzania, we have seed, seed producers who are selling for a small amount of money um, cassava planting material of high quality. Um, it also links with the authorities who manage the quality so that what is produced and sold meets the required standards. But it's done in a way that's manageable so that farmers succeed. Obviously, some of them don't quite meet the standards, and then they can use the roots. But most of the farmers are able to succeed because the, the requirements are not too stringent. Now, um, the map down the bottom left shows the, the Tava Seed Tracker has been rolled out so far in Nigeria and, and Tanzania. And we're going to talk about a little bit of a situation in Tanzania. Um, at the bottom right there is one of the seed commercial seed, seed entrepreneurs, um, Antonia, with her son, who are working on their entries into Cassava Seed Tracker. And we're trying to put together a system which we call 1 plus 1 equals 3. And this is where we're building synergy between these two apps. 
Nuru Sea Tracker uh, in the hope that what they deliver together will be more than what they can deliver alone. So Nuru is helping farmers identify the problems in their fields. So a farmer will go to her his field, say, aha, I have a problem. Nuru tells me that I've got a problem of brown streak in my field. Then Nuru will tell them, it'll guide them to Seed Tracker, which gives them an indication of where they can get high quality seed of a resistant variety. So the two are linked together and the two can identify the problem and provide a solution. We're also working, or we, we hope to work, I would say, because this has not really started yet, but with another team within ITA that's produced an app called Akilimo. Hopefully this will also be a golden egg in RTB. This is all about site-specific agronomy for cassava producers. So it'll um, identify where you are, uh, what your soil is like automatically, and then it'll provide you with recommendations, um, the optimal recommendations for growing the crop in that location. So going back to the link between Nuru and Sea Tracker, so we had very recent, this is literally a few weeks ago, um, interaction with an NGO called Hope for Girls and Women. You can see all the um, black, blue, yellow, and green um, spots. This is where there are groups of 20 largely women who, who were trained by Plant Village in recognizing cassava diseases using Nuru, and they were um, they received phones to do that. Um, and then they've been made aware of the availability of high quality seed of disease resistant varieties, which is being produced by the cassava seed entrepreneurs, which are all the individuals or the, the locations in yellow. And we actually did, a, in this case, a physical job of bringing them together. They can actually, the new users can actually go to Seed Tracker and they can get phone numbers and WhatsApp contacts of the cassava seed entrepreneurs on Seed Tracker. But in this case, we, we wanted to actually make the thing kind of happen physically, so we brought them all together. And the picture below illustrates that. So what we're looking for, looking to do on a broader scale, this is obviously a small example, is to, to take the following process. So to go through a step where we train Nuru users to identify cassava disease, um, that application will advise them on the control measure, which is to access clean, clean seed of disease resistant varieties. Um, it then links them directly to Seed Tracker through a part of the Nuru app. They fire up Seed Tracker, they get the contact information, phone number and WhatsApp of the seed producer who's nearby and they make a deal. And uh, they can get access in that way to the best seed that is available in their region. So we think that this is a small pilot scale um, application of um, the synergistic um, interaction of these two apps, but we're hoping that it's gonna be scaled and have a much bigger impact over time, and that we'll be able to help farmers identify these kinds of problems, and then identify sources of the healthy planting material of resistant varieties like this that can help them to resolve those problems. So we think also that, so as we know, phones, tablets, computers, it's not only one app that um, they will provide us with. They provide us with a world of knowledge. And we do feel very strongly that as we encourage farmers to engage with these um, ICT solutions, their knowledge will grow hugely. And as we know, knowledge is power. So we have the great hope that ICT tools such as these will deliver and will contribute significantly to agricultural transformation in Africa and elsewhere. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, James, uh, and thank you, AgriLinks, for the opportunity for this uh, very important webinar. Uh, I'm going to look at the role of our biofortified uh, uh, sweet potato in nutrition humanitarian interventions in fragile environments. Uh, it is increasingly uh, known 
that long-term humanitarian crisis are a main driver of food, global food insecurity and malnutrition. Mm. Uh, agricultural research and delivery of promising technologies for food production and utilization mass, uh, and of course, they can contribute effectively to the various um, et cetera, of efforts that is being used to respond to and over time try to reduce the need for uh, humanitarian food assistance. And this includes uh, sustainable production, distribution, and consumption of nutritious and affordable food by the vulnerable populations, especially in uh, areas of the fragile environment that we are going to see very soon. Uh, over the past 50 years, uh, the CGIR has developed various technologies, including biofortified crop varieties. And of course, uh, we've associated supported seed production and post-harvest technologies that can contribute significantly to meeting this, this, this problem or this challenge. Uh, amongst these is the orange flesh sweet potato, uh, which stands out as a highly effective source of vitamin A and other micronutrients. Uh, uh, in addition to that, it requires low input and is climate resilient uh, and has high yield. It's it yield very uh, good as well in er various areas uh, that is being produced. Uh, since 2010, SIP and partners have enabled more than close to 7 million households in both Africa and South Asia to grow uh, an increasing range of locally adopted OFSP varieties. So these varieties are adapted to the, to the conditions at the, in the country or in the agroecological region. And OFSP has gained an increasing footprint in uh, local food systems and markets as well. Uh, more recently, we've seen that humanitarian uh, agencies uh, such as the FAO, WFP, and others have started to include OFSP in their programming with an initial focus on OFSP production and, of course, uh, by vulnerable households to build their resilience in the areas that they live. And, of course, utilization of OFSP puree, which is current uh, uh, way of ensuring that the sweet potato is not, or if the sweet potato is not just consumed by uh, the rural population, but of course by the urban centers, because the puree uh, serves as an ingredient uh, that can be added to various recipes, such as uh, the big product and all that. Uh, we've seen that it is very important to recognize that by connecting a highly effective uh, set of agri-food technologies, such as the orange fresh potato varieties, with efficient and effective delivery mechanisms, uh, including the uh, programs that are being rolled out by uh, humanitarian agencies like WFP and FAO uh, in high impact environment or what we call the fragile environment. Uh, it is possible to reach significant nutrition and livelihood impact because most of these populations in these areas are always on the move or either they are refugees or internally displaced people. So the issue of uh, uh, resilience is very, very important for them to be able to produce on their own small pieces of land. And of course, uh, nutritionally, they should be able to get the nutrients that they need daily. And the orange fresh potato, we think it's very important for this aspect as well. Uh, and it's also important to know that when we transition into more market-based approaches that engages the local and national agri-food systems, it can reduce the need for uh, a lot of dependency on food uh, uh, humanitarian food aid. Uh, in this case, we are talking about uh, areas in this fragile environment. So recently, a partnership between SIP and the WFP uh, has been made, and we are looking at to improve nutrition and livelihoods of vulnerable populations at a larger scale, and also reduce the need for uh, humanitarian aid uh, through sustainable production, marketing, and consumption of orange fresh potato and other nutritious crops. Uh, the collaboration, we believe, uh, can benefit at least 10 million uh, people uh, living in long-term crisis environments. So the current uh, agreement or the partnership we have is looking at both the supply and then uh, demand uh, side of, 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 the, of the arrangement. And this includes uh, orange fresh potato and vegetables as well as other nutritious crops, including uh, biofortified iron-rich beans uh, in household production systems among uh, communities affected by displacement or climate crisis with ongoing activities in both, uh, uh, both 
Kenya and of course Uganda. I'll take Kenya and Uganda as an example, and we'll just mention a, a bit of uh, upcoming uh, implementation in Uganda as well, uh, in, in Ethiopia as well. Uh, this approach uh, introduces new and improved drought tolerant OFSP varieties, which is developed by SIP and partners. Uh, when we talk about partners, we are talking about the national partners, uh, the National Agricultural Research Services, and all that. Uh, in semi arid agroecologies, where sweet potato is a new crop, but it's, it's quite doing well in these areas, like we see here uh, in uh, an area in northern Uganda. This is uh, at the home of a refugee set, uh, settlement, uh, in Palorian settlement in uh, northern Uganda, that's the Moyo district. We've also seen that to improve the uptake of this crop, especially for vulnerable groups, including uh, young child uh, nutrition, such as children between the ages of 6 to 23 months, it is important to uh, help uh, parents or caregivers who feed these children the necessary tools uh, to be able to be able to aid them in feeding the children the right amount of food, and then including oil and fresh potato as part of the, the, uh, the diet that children have to consume to be able to meet their daily vitamin A and other nutrient needs at this critical age of uh, rapid growth. So it is very important that our SIF and partners, including Emory University and the rest, have developed this uh, tool called the Heavy Baby Toolkit, uh, which, which is, uh, consists of a bowl and a spoon. I don't know whether you can see this very well. Uh, a bowl, a demarcated bowl, and spoon which cues the mother or the caregiver as to the amount, right amount of food to feed the child based on the age of the child, as well as the number of times to feed the child in terms of the frequency. So the bowl serves as a, a guide for amount and then the frequency of food that the child has to consume at specific ages from six months all the way to uh, 23 months. And it also has a spoon which is slotted in a way to help the mother to be able to uh, assess the consistency of the food that she has to feed the child. So that if she's feeding the child a semi-solid or a, a liquid food, it should not be too liquidy uh, in terms of uh, uh, losing the benefit of the, uh, what do you call it, the nutrient density, and of course, energy density as well. So we believe the Healthy Baby Toolkit is a, a very important tool to help mothers to ensure that they are, again, being able to feed their children frequently and then uh, the amount of food that they have to feed a child and of course the consistency of the food and this is aimed at including orange fresh sweet potato as part of the healthier diet in this for in this uh, issues so uh through these approaches uh and with support from the uk aid uh, uh in 2020 sip and partners were, were able to deliver approximately 70,000 uh uh household were able to uh receive about 70, uh, 200 cartons per, per household of uh, clean planting materials of orange fresh sweet potato, uh, especially in Uganda. Uh, and, and in more so, more than 300,000 consumers were rich with OFS, orange fresh sweet potato as a food item, uh, either as root or as a big product uh, in either Kenya or Uganda. Uh, as well, based on what I've described about the nutrition, uh, we've seen that it is very, very important that the nutrition is very, very uh, uh, included in terms of either the knowledge for their mothers or the caregivers as well, also as the partners who are leading this or the frontline workers as we call them, either the community health workers or the village health teams uh, or community health volunteers, being able to have more knowledge on how to uh, feed children and in this way they also step it down to the households in this fragile environment. So these activities uh, we believe are designed and implemented within existing humanitarian programs, such as those for the BFP, uh, including those targeting uh, the refugee or IDP settlements, as I've indicated earlier. Uh, we believe that uh, it is important for us at this time, uh, the CGs should be more also interested in responding to the humanitarian uh, pro problems that are uh, coming up globally, uh, not just because of the COVID, but of course the climate, there are climate refugees uh, that are internally ref uh, displaced people. And we believe our crops, our TB crops are very resilient in helping solve some of these popul uh, issues among these populations. Uh, there is another uh, funded project that is coming up. Uh, 
I believe it has already started in, in Ethiopia. It's funded by the USAID Bureau of Humanitarian Affairs. Uh, that is benefiting about 36,000 households and at least 50,000 children under the age of five years. Uh, we are, st we are going to link with WFP in Ethiopia, uh, as well, uh, in terms of other, the global partnership that we have to be able to ensure that these approaches that we are using in Uganda and Kenya are going to be aligned in, in, uh, rolling out or delivering, uh, this important, uh, project deli uh, deliverables in Ethiopia as well. Uh, it is important to look ahead. We see that important changes are happening uh, uh, in the delivery of humanitarian food aid. And this is the opportune time, as I've said earlier, uh, to make new connections with local food systems, uh, including the utilization of biofortified crops like orange fresh sweet potato, uh, the orange maize, there's the yellow cassava, there's the iron rich bees in most uh, of these settings. Uh, uh, we are looking at the next set of activities that we need to implement uh, with WFP and SIP going forward. Uh, this include uh, linking uh, the orange fresh sweet potato producers in such areas that will work together, uh, and then the traders to institutional markets that are created through the cash transfer and other social protection schemes by WFP as a strategy for reducing dependency on humanitarian food aid through uh, stronger agricultural uh, markets. And we're also going to look at the utilization of locally or regionally manufactured uh, chef stable orange fresh sweet potato puree, as I mentioned earlier, very important so that this can contribute to improved sustainability of institutional nutrition programs, including the school feeding programs, uh, especially that, those that are being supported or implemented by the government, about being supported by WFP, uh, for example, here uh, in Uganda, in Karamoja subregion. Uh, and also, we, we see that we need to look at both the benefits and health impact in the next uh, uh, three years going forward. Uh, we, we, we plan to, first of all, we ask uh, uh, James, uh, uh, as uh, Graham said in the introductory speech, the CG centers is evolving into one CG. Uh, we are looking at uh, our regional and programmatic structures so that we can utilize that to expand this program to capture a broader range of so many very good technologies that have been developed for the past 50 years in the CG centers to make sure that they are aligned and they respond to the humanitarian needs of this of this uh, fragile environment. Uh, we also want to, in the next three years, uh, that at least 300,000 or 500,000 households will be producing nutritious crops uh, through these humanitarian programs with the BFP, FAO, uh, maybe in, uh, in uh, Bangladesh as well, in South Asia. And then we envisage that probably about 450,000 children under the age of two years old will be consuming orange fresh sweet potato using the Healthy Baby Toolkit. And in terms of the food production using orange fresh sweet potato, we are looking at about 100,000 metric tons of orange fresh sweet potato and other nutritious foods will be sold through the institutionally uh, facilitated market in these fragile environments. Because in some of these areas, there's the cash transfer uh, program that is being rolled out by WFP. Uh, and an FAO in, uh, for example, Cox Bazaar in, uh, in South, South Asia, Bangladesh. We believe that if the market system over there has more nutritious crops available, then these refugees or internally displaced persons will use the money to buy, uh, these crops. So it is important to, for example, build the seed systems in these areas and ensure that, uh, there's good clean planting materials that eventually make available nutritious foods uh, on the market so that these uh, displaced people will be able to also meet uh, their nutritional and food security uh, needs. I will stop here and I will hope we'll be able to get uh, responses to some questions that will be coming. Thank you very much. I pass it over to uh, Zachary. Thank you, Fred. Uh, thanks everyone for your the presenters for your great presentations and thanks everyone in the audience for your great dialogue and um, discussions in the chat box and then also the the many many questions that have come in and with that I will you know start in on the questions uh, I've got a question from uh, Diba Dida Wako uh, Wako um, I think this is for James. Uh, can Nuru and Seed Tracker be used for other crops other than tubers? Yes, um, it can be used for other crops. Um, maybe you didn't notice it. I think it was mentioned, it, well, it, it was in one of the images. 
Um, it's been used for fall armyworm on maize. Um, it's also been used uh, for uh, desert locust um, surveillance. Um, it's also within the RTBs, there is effort to apply it also to sweet potato and potato. Um, that's a work in progress. So as you can imagine, it, it takes quite a while to, to build up. You need large sets of images, thousands of images. Um, you need to scan them. You need to label disease portions. You need to train computers, uh, do the machine learning. So it is a little bit of a process before you can um, set up a system for a new crop. But that is underway for potato and sweet potato. And there's already an existing system for fall armyworm and a system for monitoring desert locusts. Thank you. Um, our next question comes from John Picatano, I think. Um, Fred, you mentioned orange flesh, flesh sweet potato puree markets, including for food assistance. Can you say more about where this is being produced and used and at what scale? Puree looks like a promising value addition and conservation solution and would be great to document and replicate successful efforts. Thank you very much, Zachary, and thanks for the question. Uh, so we've seen uh, that uh, puree really uh, is the way to go because it retains a lot of the vitamin A uh, compared to uh, the powdered product, which is uh, uh, very commonly used. Uh, but SIP and partners for the past uh, five years or more have been able to try as much as possible to research on and develop a shelf stable puree that can be made available on the shelves and without refrigeration, it can take up to three months on the shelves. So what we are working out with WFP currently is that uh, when they receive refugees, there is, a retention, there is a retention period for the refugees to be screened and all that, or the holding centers. So we are talking with them that in the holding center, they take about two weeks or so. So they are saying if they will be able to have the puree to be given to the refugees during the holding centers before they now uh, move them to into the settlement uh, under the tent where it, it is it's a long term process. So we are currently working with our partners both uh, in in Kenya and of course here in Uganda to see how can we move the value chain. And of course, when we are talking about humanitarian needs, we are talking about high volumes of metric tons of of uh, puree. So we need uh, to ensure that the, the, what you call it, the value chain for puree processing is very much in, 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 in place. And then in this way also, the seed system has to be very, very good because we need the farmers to be able to produce the, uh, the planting, uh, what you call it, the root, to be able to give to the processes and all that. So they are, I haven't mentioned some projects that are ongoing and looking at that as part of SIP and other partners, but there's some work that is, they are ongoing and we are working with the BFP moving forward. Uh, from 2021, 2022, the possibility of using puree in these areas. Currently, their use is not as huge as we will want, uh, but we envisage that probably the next two years or so, that will be more than we envisage, uh, we, we are doing now. Thank you very much. Thank you. Um, for our next question, uh, this is directed at Margaret, our other members of uh, KIPP. Uh, can you speak about the most successful RTB, especially sweet potato agribusinesses uh, doing production, processing, and export? What can be done to accelerate investment? Um, thank you for the question, and I, I think it's an excellent question. I was actually, when I saw the question, I, I think, Fred, you might be able to talk a bit about the collaboration in South Africa. So can I can I pass that one to to Fred? Yeah, thank you very much, Margaret. Uh, we have uh, a collaboration with our uh, uh, partners in South Africa called the Makev uh, Makev Foods, uh, where uh, the market in South Africa. This is a Belgian Belgian company based in South Africa. Uh, they've done, we've done a lot of work with them uh, going forward, trying as much as possible to ensure that the orange fresh sweet potato is incorporated in big products, not just in bread, but of course uh, other products that can be for export and, and local use as well. So uh, that is very much ahead of, of course, South Africa, uh, the process is quite ahead uh, compared to the other parts of uh, uh, Sub-Saharan Africa, but we are trying and seeing whether 
those approaches that are far advanced in South Africa, for example, can be utilized here in uh, uh, East Africa and, of course, West Africa and other countries here. So, yes, the partnership with Mackay uh, Foods is very much ahead, and they've done a lot of production in terms of uh, various food uh, uh, items using uh, the sweet potato as an ingredient in this. So we look forward. We are learning a lot from them uh, because, uh, as I said, they are very much advanced, and we, we think with those, it makes it available so that the urban population can always have access to the, the nutrient-rich orange fresh sweet potato, either in bread or cake or in juice or all these, these things that are very common in the urban areas compared to the rural settings. Yeah, thank you. Thank you. Um, we had a question early on, um, I think responding to a statement by Graham, um, from uh, Shamim Ara Begum, uh, why is it a, a women's crop? Uh, I think it was uh, sweet potato, perhaps, is in reference to. And then later we had a question from uh, a Dr. Rose Onamu, who had mentioned uh, that she had recently discovered that uh, men do not eat uh, root tubers and bananas or would rather go uh, hungry. Um, I would wonder if the panel or Graham, you could speak to uh, the sort of, or further elaborate on the gender lens uh, around. Yes, I can, I can, very bananas. good questions. Yeah, the, the first one, I said it is a bit of a simplification. So, so in some contexts, you have cash crops, right? And the roots and tubers and bananas are, in some contexts, are not a primary, uh, primary cash crop. So men kind of managing the cash crops and the roots and tubers are more seen as home gardens for subsistence use and more looked after by the women. But that is a considerable generalization. So in some cases, I think sweet potato in particular has been called a women's crop. But the, 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 the gender underpinnings of this is, is much more complex. It's, it's uh, country specific. In some countries, sweet potato is a major cash crop. Um, and one of the trends there is that often uh, if we don't have the right um, enabling instruments in place as Crops become more important, and, and opportunities for cash earning uh, appear. Then sometimes women get squeezed out. So I think the bigger question is understanding the gender roles, and women are extremely important in different ways in these crops. I mean, in, in West Africa, for cassava, um, men probably growing more of it, but actually the processing is very much in women's hands. If you go to Nigeria, you go and see Gary and Fufu being processed, it's predominantly managed by women. So the, the gender roles are important and women are very important. And it's a bit sim too simple to say that it's a women's crop. It's, it's a good point. On, on the other question on, I think it's around stigmatization of roots and tubers. And, and this is extremely variable. I'm not sure which country uh, that, that you, can, you come from, but it is quite variable. And it's true that in some Asian countries in particular, um, roots and tubers have been somewhat stigmatized. In, in, in China, sweet potato used to be a huge crop, and now it's associated a bit with the hard times and, and poverty, so it has become stigmatized. So in some parts of the world, and, but these are extremely, you know, have many, very many benefits for people in terms of, you know, the fibers, more di diversified diet. Um, so some places there's, a, there's work to be done to improve the image of, of roots and tubers. In other places, they have the most amazing image, right? In, uh, in Nigeria, if you can't get hold of yams, you can't even get married. So the attitudes and the sort of cultural perceptions of roots and tubers and bananas are extremely important, and it's something that we can grapple with, but also that we can change. Um, sweet potatoes sometimes also, you know, seen as as cases in 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 Africa where they've been used as um, in HIV um, because it's very soft to eat and nutritious, and then they kind of get stigmatized as HIV HIV sufferers and not as part of the general population. So that's something to work on and to improve the perception sometimes by men that these are less good for you or less healthy. So it's something certainly that we, we are absolutely working on to improve those, those, those perceptions in a balanced way so these crops can achieve their full potential with all segments of society. So thanks for the great questions. Not sure I exactly answered it, but hopefully helped. Thanks. Um, for the next question, kind of following on uh, some of the challenges that you noted, Graham, uh, Ramatu uh, Mahama, uh, ask, back in 1988, we characterized root tuber banana crops, specifically cassava, as a neglected crop. 30 years on, and they are still neglected. Ghana had interventions to improve the root and tuber value chains. 
IITA uh, researched on these crops. Um, what was not done right or um, could have been done better? And what will be the game changer um, in the opinion of our, our speakers? Um, I can maybe go first and then perhaps James can, can speak to that as well. I mean, so the work of IETA and other RTB partners in, in Africa on cassava has had a huge impact. There's been broad adoption of modern varieties over the past 30, 40 years. Um, this disease resistance has been introduced, so really major impacts through the work. Uh, so maybe it's still somewhat underinvested, but the picture has changed. Many of the large in investors that uh, work with us are now seeing increasingly potential in, in, in cassava. So obviously we need to do more and more impacts, but it isn't that uh, we didn't get anywhere. And maybe I'll hand it over to James who can follow up. Yeah, I was, I was kind of thinking of similar things. I think there needs to be more determined local investment and a recognition that there are commercial opportunities with cassava. Um, so it's not just a food security crop, um, because you know there's there's industries popping up quite quickly now, particularly in Nigeria, in different kinds of processing, um, starch, high quality flour, beer, um, and which seem to be going quite successfully. Um, I think another key thing is is maximising productivity of the crop, and I think this is an area where we've really not made the progress that we should have done. It's great that we've got this uh, big Gates funded project called Akai and Akilimo, which is the app associated with that, which is going to help um, drive productivity forward and help farmers recognize where a fertilizer that they can access will help them to get a bigger yield. Um, because obviously, you know, the more productive, um, the more opportunities there are going to be for sale of produce. So it, it'll move from being just a food crop to something that can be traded. Um, I'm also thinking, you know, we probably need to move a little bit towards the approaches that have been adopted in Asia, where a little bit larger scale, just a little bit more organized with, um, with groups of farmers working together, um, sharing of machinery um, and um, weed control. I, I think somebody mentioned it in the questions. Weed control, I think, is very poorly managed. You know, we're still mainly um, pushing, uh, cut, you know, removing weeds with hose, which needs to change because you know fields are getting bigger, um, and we need them to be bigger to have a more commercially viable production system. So um, it's great. Also, I was I was reminded by Godwin Atza, who's on the call, that there is a weed a herbicide calculator. Um, which is available for use and can help farmers to improve their weeding. So I think some of those things are um, could be part of a game-changing situation. And another big one, of course, is policy support. I think th this has changed quite dramatically over the last decade. Um, there's a lot more interest at government level in the potential of cassava, and uh, we need just we just need to see more of that. And maybe I can just chip in again there. So on the process. Thing. We actually have been doing a lot of work. Processing is something that's really moved up in, in our priorities. We've been working on um, in actually downscaling flash dryers. So flash dryers are used in Asia for processing cassava. They're just too big for many African contexts. So we're working actually to downscale them so they can work at a smaller scale. And we're also working on understanding much better the, the processed Gary and Fufu products and the quality traits in those so that we can do a better job. So I think the processing is also beyond the farm level stuff, it's absolutely a, um, a key bottleneck that's been underinvested and, and there is actually some good progress underway that hopefully will work its way through to, um, not to farmers' fields, but to, to farmers' sort of processing centers and in particular women's processing centers. Thanks. Thank you. Um, I think the next question is for Margaret. It comes from uh, Helen Hambly. Uh, totals for seed systems online training looks great. How many can you accommodate in the training event? How can we get info out to intermediaries in extension services and NGOs? Great, thank you, Helen, for, for that question. The, the training will be both uh, virtual and, um, and in country. 
And so in terms of the virtual training, there's no, uh, there's no maximum really. But what we're trying to do is identify um, small teams, which could either be a country team or an organizational team or a project team that want to start using some of the tools in their own situation. Um, and so the virtual training will provide uh, an overview and an introduction to the tools. And then the small teams will be able to identify one or two tools or more that they would like to use. And then they will be mentored through using the tools and come out with a small proposal after after one or two months for further investment in their in their seed system. So the the teams that we're looking for in country are hopefully teams that are already working on seed systems that have some constraints at the back of their mind um, that. They, that we want to put together a multidisciplinary team and also twin team members uh, with more junior uh, colleagues in their organization and with more senior colleagues in their organization. So please, please get in contact um, if you would like to take part in that training. Okay, um, for our next question, uh, from Dick Tinsley, given the large extent that RTB are vegetatively propagated and done mostly locally and or through uh, informal sources, does that impact on the intellectual property rights and thus the potential for private investment, leaving the development of RTB to public sector, including the CDR institutes? Over. That's a pretty challenging question there on the intellectual property rights. Um, I don't know. I mean, in practice, in many of the countries we work, the protection of intellectual property rights is anyway quite weak. So I, I don't think that's a major concern that, that I've seen, uh, that differentiate RTB crops from other crops. Um, I think the issues around creating an enabling environment for entrepreneurial activity to, to happen and to, to having a sort of good, strong business plan and teaming up with the right people so that that, that can happen. I, I'm not sure that fundamentally IP is a major concern on this. I'm not sure any of my other fellow panelists have got a better answer on this quite tricky question. Any others to follow up on that? If not, I can go on to the next question. I think so. Okay. Um, so for the next question, it was for, where did you go? Oh yes, for um, Fred, it's um, from Pernur, Nur, nah, uh Garg, uh, very important initiative on sweet potato fortification. How about introducing this in school programs and low socioeconomic segments? Any implementation programs in India? Over. Yeah, thank you very much. I just finished <laughs> providing the answer for her. So let me just uh, go over for the whole uh, panel and then of course the listeners as well. Yes, Pranar, this is, thank you very much for this question. It's very, very important. Uh, we are uh, including orange fresh potato in school feeding programs in Uganda in collaboration with WFP, especially uh, where WFP is supporting the, uh, the what we call homegrown school feeding program in Karamoja that is implemented by the government and supported by WFP. Uh, as we speak, last week we supplied a lot of vines to uh, the schools to uh, plant in their school gardens and they use some of these to include in their kitchen uh, food that they prepare in their kitchen for the, for the children. Uh, you can see they have a lot of uh, uh, grains in the, in the school feeding and all that, but we've been working with them since the last two years uh, in Eastern uh, Uganda and now in Karamoja to ensure that all fresh sweet potato find its way into uh, the school feeding program as uh, well, where the children are going to eat. And of course, they also take some of the seeds back home to their parents 
to plant uh, so that not just at school, but at home also they can have access to the orange fresh sweet potato. Uh, we, we uh, in, in India, we are in, in the stage of uh, getting a proposal done for uh, funding by one of the states. I, I'm, I've forgotten the name of the state. It starts with an M. I was trying to look at it when I was called. So uh, it is looking at the nutrition sensitive lens of OFSP's contribution to improve nutrition and income in that state. Uh, I think later I'll be able to uh, give you the name of the state in there. But yes, we have some uh, activities in India uh that are coming up and it's going to be very exciting because some of the the governors in the states about two or three states have expressed interest but this particular state has indicated then uh the willingness to fund some of these activities in there yeah thank you very much thank you uh this is probably a, a fairly large question for the the group uh this is from Meiguri uh, Sethri. Uh, nowadays, game-changing solutions to transform food systems are very popular. What are RTB's suggestions to one or two such game-changing solutions? Over. Well, who wants to go first on this one, guys? Um... So, I mean, so the neuro is, for example, a game-changing solution. Sometimes game-changing solutions is kind of a synonym with um, some of the work on genetic modification, um, which is also does feature in our program where, where countries want that. Um, but I think we have, so the, yeah, the, the work on the, the AI, I think this is kind of game-changing. We would say that our work on, on seed systems as well is potentially a game-changer. So I think many of the, the, the work that we presented today is, pretty novel, you know, understanding how farmers are networked and, and having a transformative approach to for me, this would also be um, game changing. But I'll let, let my colleagues uh, chip in as well on their other suggestions for the, the, the game changing elements. Hopefully they've kind of thought about what else we might um, explain. Uh, my, my comment on that would be the going back to what I said in my talk, that knowledge is power. And farmers have had almost no knowledge apart from what they've learned from their forefathers um, and mothers up until very recently. But and we've had extension systems which have not had the resources to get knowledge to their farming communities. But with the kinds of affordable ICT tools that we're getting now, this I, I see this as really a game-changing um, situation. And particularly if we can bring them together in suites, suites of tools that will work to support each other's function. So we have a tool that can help diagnose a disease. We can have a tool that can identify a source of healthy plant and material to solve the disease. We can have a tool that can identify the nearest market. And we have productivity tools that can give the farmers the best option to boost their, um, their yields. Um, I just see this is opening farmers' eyes up. You know, um, the whole system of um, getting information to our farmers will change, and it's going to change in five years. You know, we, we're in a really critical phase, and we need to push as hard as we can, as fast as we can, so that the farmers can get access to affordable tools with um, tools um, on those. Uh, devices that will meet their needs and uh, help them to improve their livelihoods. So, yeah, some of these things I think are going to be hugely game changing. And in 20 years' time, I think we're going to see a, a different environment altogether in the farming world in Africa. So, just to complement that point of James, so when we began working in RTB, we were looking at agronomy, and and it really didn't seem feasible to to deliver, to understand what farmers wanted in their fields and to deliver solutions around agronomy. And really that, that, that context has been, has been transformed by the availability of um, you know, mobile phone technology, not only for us getting information to farmers, but for us receiving information. So I think that certainly has been one of the real game-changing things over the past 10 years that we've experienced. So I'd, I'd really support James on that one. But Margaret's got some more ideas here, Margaret. Yeah, I, th I, th I think, you know, you, we can look at 
you know, game-changing solutions, but we need to also consider game-changing processes. And what's critical there is partnering and who we're partnering, because as the as the CG, we cannot do it ourselves. And so these forums are, are critically important, and the relationship with national stakeholders, particularly the national research programs. And then the other process, which is critically important, and I saw uh, Murat had a, had a question, is, you know, how do we scale these innovations? And, and there's a lot of work that has been done there, and that work needs to be integrated into, in, into other aspects of our work. So I think we need to look at game-changing processes as well as the actual um, technologies. Thank you. Excellent. Well, thank you all. Uh, Fred, do you have a comment? Sorry. Yeah. I cut you off. Sorry. Sorry, Zachary. Yeah. No, no, no. So, Go ahead. Uh, I mean, <laughs> when we talk about game changing, uh, 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 in terms of what we've been seeing uh, so far, you know, for example, I know WFP spends a lot of money uh, in Uganda alone, almost uh, hundreds of millions of dollars every year just to hand out food food uh, items to refugees, uh, internally displaced people. And most of these food items are imported out of the country. So you can see the amount of money. So I believe uh, the contribution of the RTB crops being resilient uh, in helping uh, people, uh, to win uh, off these uh, vulnerable populations from food handouts and build resilience amongst them. It's also game changing. I think that is why WFP was really uh, welcoming to our idea of collaborating with them to ensure that uh, households of these vulnerable populations in fragile environment. And those sweet potato, most of these uh, RTB crops does very well, irrespective of where you are. Uh, whether it's the dry area in northern Karamoja or northern part of Uganda or Kenya, you can still find sweet potato growing uh, the backyard of the refugees. Even the small five by five meters, uh, five by six meter plot, they're able to sweet potato and other vegetables and all that. So I think that is why we think this is a, a game changing approach. That's why uh, the CG centers should be able to now look ahead and say, how can we help? Because now this is the way to go. Okay, uh, when we look at the, the humanitarian crisis, it keeps coming every year. It is either political issues, it's either by climate, it's either by internally generated. It keeps coming. How can we, as CG centers, how can our technologies be useful in such environments as well? So I think, in in essence, uh, that is a, a game changing approach for the RTB crops, especially for OFSB currently. And we envisage that probably uh, other crops will come on board to help this out. Thank you. Thank you, everyone. Thank you to our speakers. Uh, we really appreciate your participation in this webinar and the, the theme month uh, writ large. And so, again, we appreciate the, the presentation. And um, thanks also to our audience for all your great questions, for the great discussion. Um, just so you know, the recording, all the resources, transcripts will be emailed to those who have registered. Otherwise, you can go to the AgriLinks events page and check that out. Um, please note that we will be um, providing a link for you to evaluate the presentation. We're always, or evaluate the, the webinar. Um, we're always looking for your feedback on how to improve upon these uh, events and uh, the webinar. and uh, you know, what other kind of content that we can, can cover for AgriLinks. Um, note, our upcoming theme month, um, very exciting, is uh, food safety. Um, food safety, World Food Safety Day is June 7th. And so as part of that, we will be focusing on um, food safety throughout the, the month of June for AgriLinks. And so with that, I wish you all the uh, best for the rest of your day, whether it's through the morning, the afternoon, or into the evening. Um, please uh, stay safe and stay healthy. Thank you. Have a good day.